extraordinary. So, so I'm here today as a uh, New Jersey refugee. Um, it's really, I've been looking forward to this day, let's see, since, uh, since 11 days ago when we lost power and uh, we got two feet of snow and it's been about 25 degrees every night. So I'm really happy to be here and no offense or anything, I was really looking forward to the hot shower even more than this. <laughs> so all's good right now. Anyway, and, and that's another reason I don't have a I don't have a slideshow for you. So it is what it is. I got to read. So sorry about that. Um, there are many reasons why I love this museum, and I grew up uh, a little bit in Europe, so I used to go to an awful lot of museums. I taught myself art history when I was in high school, and we have in our family a little bit of an artistic streak going back about five generations on my mother's side. So. I apparently demonstrated a little bit of that, enough so that my sixth grade teacher said, her last words when I was graduating was, uh, come back and see us when you're a famous artist. And of course that never happened. So today, uh, the sum total of my life experience, I guess, would be, I've owned a number of different businesses. I'm an attorney specialized in securities litigation, former CBS radio show host, I've written a bunch of books, different topics, and I'm also a trained psychic detective, trained remote viewer, spiritual medium, and uh, medical intuitive. One of the e really extraordinary things, for me anyway, about uh, this museum is its unique collection of paintings by Ingo Swan. Ingo was a so-called visionary artist, you probably know that, he was living in New York City, he wrote a few porn books on the side to pay the bills. And then he ended up becoming incredibly famous as a so-called psychic spy and founder of a CIA and military funded program uh, that's known as uh, remote viewing. It was the Stargate project. So I don't have time to go into all the history on that. In fact, I just gave a presentation out in Phoenix at the uh, International UFO Congress uh, convention a couple of weeks ago about remote viewing the extraterrestrials. Whole other topic. But su suffice it to say that remote viewing allows a person to see things that are currently unknowable in terms of time or distance. And it seems to me that what a lot of, in fact, probably every single one of the other speakers who's already spoken, they have been speaking about either the concept of time or the concept of matter. And this kind of perception bypasses all of our traditional notions about that. Anyway, so I, I knew Ingo for about 10 years. He became a mentor to me. And at the time I met him, which was around 2003, I was writing a book that I thought was gonna be about the psychology of intuition. And as I quickly learned, psychologists had absolutely no interest in this topic presumably because it's too slippery and elusive to capture as a phenomenon, and perhaps, I think, more importantly, because within the therapist-patient dynamic, uh, they'd have to give up their mantle of higher authority and give up their control over the session because intuition is an equal opportunity source of knowledge. You can't be an authority if you're not in c control of the information. So then I went off, I studied a bit of neuroscience, and I thought, well, maybe these guys have figured out what the brain structure is doing during an intuitive experience. And again, I was very disappointed because they ran away from it. I think they've gotten better since then, but they, you know, they labeled it hopelessly subjective. So then I began to interview anybody, and I mean anybody, who could tell me anything about intuition. And that's when I started to run into these very peculiar people who I had never encountered really in my life, known as psychics and mediums. And ultimately, I realized if I was going to speak intelligently on this topic, I was going to have to learn how to do it and not just talk about it. It's very experiential. And that is why I've spent so much time training to be what you would call psychic. And that's how I went from being allegedly not psychic to being allegedly psychic. That's a whole other topic. Anyway, so that was how I met Ingo. 
he was living in the Bowery, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan at the time, and for reasons unbeknownst to me, he decided to grant me this interview because he'd stopped giving interviews at that time, and we sort of had an ongoing conversation for many years. And we often spoke in the dark confines of his basement studio, which was full of you know, glass jars of drying paint brushes and colored paints and beat up furniture, and the place smelled like cheap cigar smoke, which I realized later that was his sort of trademark thing. One of the things that I loved about Ingo was that he clearly had a mastery, not just over the right hemisphere of his brain, which is the source of all things psychic, nonverbal, and artistic, but also his left hemisphere, governing language, analysis, and logic. He was what I like to call an ambidextrous thinker, and they're rare in this world. They can travel seamlessly between two separate worlds of thought processing. And if I were to use a contemporary analogy, I would say it's kind of like being a political analyst who can watch both CNN and Fox News without getting sick to their stomachs. <laughs> so Inga's degree in college was in biology. He was a stickler for analyzing actual definitions of words and would often, in the course of our conversations, pull out a dictionary off the shelf and he'd tell me how completely wrong and misguided I was because I didn't understand the origin of some word that I had used. And we would also sit out on the stoop of the, uh, he had a building in Manhattan. We'd sit out there on the stoop, watch the world go by for hours. We'd discuss the auras of people as they passed by he would point out the ghosts lurking on the sidewalks. We discussed everything from psychic spying to UFOs and extraterrestrials to the neuroscience of intuition. He would chain smoke his cigars, make provocative comments about the world, and laugh about the irony of everything. Ingo was one of those rare individuals who truly had an understanding of I guess what I'm calling the two views of heaven, the topic of this conversation, of this conference. He understood that a world lies beyond our 3D physical comprehension, and he could perceive its interaction in this world. He also understood the need to bring this kind of understanding into the fold of our scientific realm so it could achieve a respectable status of what we call reality. His work in remote viewing was part of this effort. He enabled people to enter that forbidden realm of the mind. Since Ingo's passing in 2013, I have really tried very hard to follow in his footsteps and perpetuate his legacy. One of my most treasured items is um, a book that he gave me out of his private collection. It's a book on prophecy. And today, I have, uh, I have a website called theskepticalpsychic.com. And on that, uh, I have a page there which is open to anybody worldwide who wants to make predictions. And then what I do is I try to track those predictions uh, and to see if they come true or not. And that's a type of a, uh, a feedback. And because these predictions are time-stamped, you can't dismiss them that easily. And so the whole idea there is to bring the, the so-called woo-woo world into the realm of our consensus reality and to make it real. I've also recently developed a new type of remote viewing I call TSP. It's quite different from controlled remote viewing, CRV, that was developed by Ingo and laser physicists Hal Puthoff and Russell Targ at the Stanford Research Institute back in 73. And although I've seen many people claim to have developed new types of remote viewing since then, my impression is that most of them uh, are really not much more than sort of permutations of, of CRV. They might change a little term here or the order of something, but they're fundamentally variations on Ingo's CRV. So I figured a half a century has gone by since CRV was first developed. It's probably about time to move that conversation forward a bit. So my style of remote viewing is a mix of CRV protocols, psychic and mediumship techniques, 
and skills used in intuitive gestalt psychotherapy, in which I'm certified and I trained for about 20 years. So in the time I have left, I, I, I want to tell you a personal story. So I, I seem to find myself added on to these um, online groups and email threads with an awful lot of famous theoretical and quantum physicists and neuroscientists. I am never quite sure what I'm doing there because I'm not a scientist. Um, I have a great appreciation for scientists. My, my father was a, me uh, he was an internationally recognized medical scientist. So as a little girl, I, instead of going to an office, I would go to the laboratory and I would watch him do surgery on etherized rats, giants, giant frogs, dogs, cats, sheep, and monkeys. Nobody in my family was psychic. They were very intellectual and academic. They thought psychiatrists were nuts, which doesn't leave too much room for psychics. <laughs> so, so after I, I had been reading these various posts for a long time by these very illustrious scientists, and of course I can only understand about half of what they're saying, if that, because it's a lot of mathematical stuff. But anyway, one day they were discussing possible ways to analyze, because they were talking about consciousness, ways to scientifically approach consciousness. So they're talking about out-of-body experiences, known as OBEs, in terms of quantum mechanics. And they mentioned Ingo's research in this field. So I decided what, it was time to pop my head up in this group, because I actually had discussed out-of-body experiences with Ingo in person. And I had done that because I had told Ingo about a dream I'd had. And the, in this dream, I was visiting him in Manhattan. And I, I've been a lucid dreamer since I was a little kid. And uh, I also fly around a lot in my dreams. And actually, I read a long time ago that if you fly in your dreams, it's a sign of sexual immaturity. So I'm, I'm hoping that since I continue to fly around a lot in my dreams, that maybe that's an archaic concept from old Freudian psychology. Uh, at any rate, so I was flying into New York City to see Ingo. And there were a lot of tall skyscrapers, and I'm flying right through them. I'm flying through the, the walls and the, the ceilings and the brick and everything. And I thought it was a little peculiar. So since I was never really sure what people meant when they talk about an OBE, out-of-body experience, I asked him, I mean, did, does this constitute a true OBE? And he said, yes. And that put a whole new spin on the potential for this type of dreaming. So I mentioned this to this group of scientists. I, I raised a certain degree of mayhem and disrupted the scientific discourse. I was told initially that I was engaging in some form of delusion of grandeur after I described my concept of being able to access any location in time or space using remote viewing techniques. But I continued to battle my way through this hornet's nest of academic science. And finally, this was the good part, one by one, I began to hear their personal stories of the weird and unexplained and it was thrilling. It was like I had finally unlocked the padlock to the scientific mind, or at least I had created a tiny opening for the possibility that there might be some legitimate basis for the exploration of these concepts. And as I mentioned, it's very important when, to have your own experience in these realms in order to accept the possibility that they might even be real or to speak about it intelligently. And since most people are polarized in their belief systems and cannot integrate the two views of heaven, they have no interest in exploring something which in their world does not exist. So all of this talk about OBEs must have stuck in my brain. So roughly a week and a half ago, I had another lucid dream. And of course, I was flying again. I don't recall what the dream was about. I only remember that at the end of the dream, I was flying and I was approaching this solid concrete wall. And beyond that one, there was another wall. I think it was made out of brick or glass or something. And so I was getting ready to, you know, I was thinking about flapping my arms harder to get some lift to get over the top of the wall. 
And then I said, well, wait a second. Wouldn't it be interesting to go back and test that OBE dream that I told Ingo about years ago? So I consciously decided in my dream to fly headfirst into the series of these walls and to register the physical sensation of what it felt like. And the experience was very interesting. And by the way, did you know that in French, I'm, my husband is French and I'm now French, the word experience, like experience, is the, it means experiment. I was able to transfer my body through these solid walls effortlessly. I felt my body turn into a mass of particles. It was slightly dizzying. It felt like a buzzing sensation. And I also experienced a drop in temperature, a sensation of coolness that was very striking. Between each wall, my body seemed to reassemble itself back into a single entity. Now, I might use the analogy of the field of cymatics. I don't know if you guys know about cymatics. But that's, uh, in, in cymatics, you generally, you have a plate or a surface or a membrane. You cover it with some particles, little particles or, or some type of liquid. And then you run a frequency through it. So it vibrates to that frequency. And for each different frequency, you get like a different kaleidoscopic type of a pattern. So it occurred to me that I wouldn't be surprised that if we can dematerialize our physical body by tuning ourselves to different frequencies, then we can retune ourselves to our original frequency to reconstitute the original physical body. Whatever the case may be, what I was clearly doing was running a scientific experiment about consciousness while in another state of consciousness. And wouldn't it be interesting to find out whether this information has any correlates in the world of physical science? Wouldn't that be extraordinary to learn that we can actually rearrange physical matter by using our minds? So again, in one of those syn well, synchronicities, I have an awful lot of those, two days after writing this, this uh, theoretical physicist sends me an 88-page re report, 88 page report and uh, the report is entitled Teleportation Physics Study. It was commissioned in 2003 or thereabouts by the Air Force Research Laboratory of the Air Force Material Command at Edwards Air Force Base. And it was absolutely fascinating because it addresses several different theoretical models to explain the phenomenon of teleportation. And again, I couldn't understand half of it because it's in mathematical equations, but that's okay. I still fight my way through these things. Um, it interestingly talked about tests that were being conducted, now this is already a while ago, by the Chinese government showing that gifted psychic children can teleport both living and non-living things, like insects, in double-blind studies. And the report postulates several different explanations for this phenomenon, including Wormholes, multiple dimensions, parallel universes, quantum entanglement, and spatial geometry. American scientists have been able to teleport a laser beam containing a radio signal inside of it. The radio signal survived, but the laser beam did not. And quantum physicists have suggested that teleported photon states must travel at 10 to the seventh times the speed of light in order to cause entanglement. And so it's already getting really difficult when you're dealing with an entire giant network of a human being, which is, I think, 10 to the 12th number of atoms to get them all working together and teleported together. Um, Interestingly, the report stated that one of the current problems with quantum teleportation is trying to figure, quote, how we can achieve an extreme level of environmental isolation for an object, let alone a living being that breathes air and radiates heat, end quote. The report explains, quote, experiments with atoms and larger objects must be in a vacuum to avoid collisions with molecules. Thermal radiation from the walls of a teleportation apparatus would easily disturb a tiny amount of matter. At present, decoherence imposes a fundamental limit 
on quantum entanglement and teleportation, end quote. And so, so suddenly, <clears throat> made sense to me why I dreamt that experience, that sensation of coldness while teleporting in my dream. It's because we can't radiate heat while teleporting. It would, it would screw it up. It, it disturbs the quantum process. And then another thing occurred to me, that over the years, many UFO abductees claim that during their abduction scenarios, they often experience the sensation not only of being paralyzed, but they're then floated up into the air, and many of them experience their bodies passing through walls and ceilings and windows and things like that. I've spoken to several people who've described that kind of experience to me in detail. And if you study these abduction scenarios, it becomes clear that aliens or extraterrestrials are able to demonstrate some very sophisticated mental powers and mind control techniques. This has only confirmed my belief that there is a relationship between consciousness, intention, and physical matter. The ability to deconstruct the human body or objects in our environment to cause matter from one entity to penetrate matter from a different entity, living or non-living, is not science fiction, it's real. So let me give you one more example, and this one involves metal bending. So last October, I attended a remote viewing conference in Las Vegas, and towards the end of the conference, the organizer, who's a physicist, and there were about 20, of, 20 attendees or so, we're all there, uh, he says, okay, we're, we're gonna do, uh, I want you all to use your mental powers to bend spoons. Spoon bending is not new. It was made famous by Uri Geller, uh, who also was in the remote viewing program same time as Ingo was. Many thousands of people are able to do this with only either mild physical effort or no, none at all. I only recently figured out how to do this. So the organizer dumps out a big pile of cutlery, you know, forks, spoons, knives, all kinds of stuff on, on the coffee table. And he decides to be tricky, and he'd gone to Hoden Depot and picked up some three-eighths of an inch diameter uh, solid steel rods. They were about, uh, about that long. And uh, he had already determined they were not bendable by any type of physical force with the hands. So I pick one up. I figure I've done the other stuff. Let me see if I can try this, figuring there's no way. We all know, we know this is not you know, can't be done. So I picked up the rods, and anyway, the bottom line is within about 10 minutes, uh, it began to melt in my hands, and I, I be, was able to bend it with very, very little effort. And that was thrilling. Uh, and I was the only person who bent anything. I didn't bring that with me. I brought, because I got really bored sitting in the dark without any power for the last two weeks, I've been bending spoons. <laughs> so... <laughs> I bought some of these to show you, but anyway, it, it, it can be done. Um, so, the mental energy of intention clearly operates on many mysterious levels. Jack Hoke, who I think Rebecca actually knew when he was alive, he was an aeronautic engineer who began exploring this field of metal bending. He found that metal that had been bent by the mind actually uh, demonstrated microscopic changes in the molecular composition of the metal. So the inescapable conclusion is that the human mind can cause molecular changes in matter. The parallels between OBEs, remote viewing, metal bending, and UFO abductee experiences all suggest to me that we need to further explore the relationship between consciousness and matter. This is the link between the spiritual and the physical worlds. They are connected. If we could just get over the weirdness aspect of these experiences, because they're so incongruous with our normal perceptions of reality, we could really advance our scientific understanding of our relationship with the universe. And this all goes back to the concept that we are literally, not just figuratively, connected and interrelated. And once we understand this, then absolutely nothing 
Nothing is impossible. Thank you.